Thank you. I love you. I'm not going to promise anything better today, but I'm going to do my best. John 12, 12. The next day, the huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. They broke off palm branches and went out to meet him. And they cheered, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Yes, the king of Israel. If you're new to church, it's really cool that you're here. This is what we celebrate on the religious calendar the Sunday before Easter, Palm Sunday. And, uh, you know, we're Mainers. We wouldn't really wave palms. We would wave fir and spruce branches. But those needles get into the carpet for at least six months. And so we're going to let you use your own hands today. But I want to talk to you on this thought. And it might be appropriate for, day, <clears throat> for today. In fact, you could share your, my message title with your neighbor. Just tell them, I feel like breaking something. Just go ahead and, and turn to your neighbor and tell them, I feel like breaking something today. I don't know. Turn to your other name and say, are you mad, friend? Are you mad? Are you angry today? And then you can be seated. I feel like breaking something. I just feel like breaking something. Is it just me? Or is it really maybe something you've perceived? That it seems like people's anger level is like pretty high right now. Like it doesn't take long to let people talk to find out that everybody's just kind of kind of got an under-the-surface level of ticked off about something all the time. And I think there's a lot of reasons that we could find out why that is, but there just kind of is an edge. If you just, you almost know what buttons to push because you can get a reaction out of somebody. I heard recently about a husband who had texted his wife and he said, you're negative. She texted him back. You lazy, good-for-nothing, insecure, lousy excuse for a husband. How dare you? And he texts back, your COVID test is negative. (laughs) How many of you have treaded upon those kind of conversations before? You're like, you just put it in reverse and just beep, beep, beep your way out of a conversation you had no intention on getting involved in. I want to tell you that, that we not only have a lot of emotions. You're just going to have to follow me. This is totally different, but it's the way that I downloaded it, and I'm going to try to present it to you, and hopefully it will make sense to all of us and help us. But not only are people emotional, do you know that God has feelings? God is not governed by his emotions, but he has emotions. We are made in his image and in his likeness. So to have an emotion, to have feelings is not um, uh, carnal. It is actually part of being in the image of God. In fact, we read this story today of how Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a, a colt, a donkey, and they take the palm branches and they start waving them in praise before Jesus. And you've seen maybe video or pictures of it or if you're a Sunday school alumnus, you saw it on the, uh, on the, the little boards that they would have in class, felt boards, where Jesus would ride in and people just were lining the streets giving him praise. It was like a Jesus parade. But after he gets through that parade of people in the central inner city of Jerusalem, he goes up on a hill after that in Luke chapter 19. And watch how he responds. I'm going to come back to the, to the text. But look at what Jesus does after that praise service. But as he came to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to what? He began to weep. He began to get very emotional. How many of you have won some Sunday school awards because you memorized the scripture, Jesus wept? All right. Well, here's the second time he weeps. Verse 42. How I wish today that all of you people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and the peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Jesus looks down over the city and he sees into the future a moment that actually is worse than what happened on October the 7th with the Hamas attack on Israel. While we are still hearing the most unbelievable, gruesome reports, hard to believe humans could imagine such vile wickedness. 
That is only a small piece of what actually happened decades later after Jesus saw Jerusalem. He literally saw the moms and dads and the babies and the children being brutalized and the city just being torn down by demonically driven enemies and haters of God's people. And Jesus looks down on the people and his heart is overwhelmed. He becomes emotional because he recognizes that the people have become so consumed in so many things that they can't discern that their time for visitation is about to pass. They become so involved with the things that are temporary that they completely miss the eternal son of God. They have made priority of things that will only last a little while while ignoring the fact that the eternal king who could bring hope and salvation to a people is going to just pass through their midst and they won't even know that he was there. I don't know. I can't prove it. But it could be that if Israel, if the Jews would have accepted the fact that Jesus was there, that he is God's son sent for the salvation, that could it be the people could have united under Christ and this great future destruction, the annihilation of a city, nearly annihilated, would not have happened. I don't know. But it makes us understand that when God sees people in culture that are broken, hurting, abused, disenfranchised, neglected, uh, 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 treated wrong. It hurts the heart of God. It makes him weep. But as you watch him move from the mountaintop where he becomes very burdened for the broken people, that emotion from weeping turns into incredible anger because when he comes down off that mountain, you read in the next verse in verse 45 that Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. And he says, the scriptures declare my temple will be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus turns from the weeping priest, the weeping prophet, the weeping Messiah, and he comes down into the church, and he becomes the angry uh, angry cleanser of the church. I mean, he walks in like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. And he starts physically picking people up and throwing them out of the church. He starts physically taking the tables and turning them over. They are misusing people who want God. They're making church an opportunity to become profitable. They're only looking at church as a business. They've done everything they could to make it difficult for people to come into God's presence. And God gets in that church and he says, I've gone from feeling sorry for you to now you have made me really ticked off. I really want to break something in this place. And I wonder, I'm going to get to my text in a minute, but I wonder today, How many churches Jesus is invited to that it ticks him off when he sees what's going on inside? I think that when Jesus goes into, and he is going to check out the churches in the last days, and some churches are going to lose their light, they're going to lose God's presence, they'll just be a nonprofit that will meet under the guise of a of charitable organization, but God won't be found in any seat of that place because he does sees no reason for him to be there because the people are too consumed with religion and profiting themselves in their own comfort, and they don't even realize the purpose for the church and it makes God angry and he says I want to break something when I get into churches like that I'm going to tell you this is a high building I hope that he doesn't come here and feel the same way about us it would take a long time to unbury some of you because he walks in and he says I know what my church could do for the people I know what my gathering is supposed to be affecting. I know what the ecclesia is supposed to produce. And if the church would get on fire, maybe the culture would wake up that the time for an awakening is now. 
Maybe if the church got on fire, maybe if the church got started living holy, maybe if the church stopped being so greedy, maybe if the church got back on its knees, maybe if the church got humble, maybe if the church stopped being addicted to its own dead religious ways, maybe if the church got back to the Bible and back to prayer and back to the supernatural and the fire of God fell, maybe the culture would wake up and say, we'll not miss our moment of visitation. It is here and it's now if we'll get hungry for it. God says, I got to break some stuff. And I think that God needs to break some stuff. Our, our nation is in a spiritual battle. Last year in 2000, April 28th through 30th, I want them to show that graphic. April 28th through the 30th was the largest gathering of Satanists in history. They gathered in Boston. Statistics say that in America, there are 1.5 million Satanists. And as you can see, they didn't have to beg people and they didn't have to give away flat screen TVs to get people to come to their outreach. They sold out. And here are three of the many topics that they taught. <clears throat> Reclaiming the trans body. Satanism and self-pleasure. Deconstructing your religious upbringing. There is, a, I told you this last week, there is a satanic reality and it is growing in the United States of America and because many churches are dead and sleeping, the culture doesn't even know that these Satanists are affecting the government and the government is creating legislation that is affecting parents. And when a government, <laughs> I might, this church might be, this might be the attendance before the year's over if I keep preaching like this, but get used to it because I'm not going to stand before God one day and be guilty of not telling you what that Bible says. I'm going to tell you, no, no, hear this, hear this, here's what the scripture, here's, here's what the spirit has been saying to me. When a government takes the rights away from parents over their children, that's one of the last satanic things that can happen in a nation. You say, well, you shouldn't be political in church. I'm not being political. I'm being spiritual. And there's a spirit behind that garbage that just got passed out in the state house trying to tell you you can't have an authority over your children. It's time for the church to rise up and stop being liked by everybody. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. Stop having the same priorities as the world and say, if I'll put God first, God will take care of my family. And there's no weapon that can form against me if I stay in the middle of God's will. Let me tell you what Charleston Church is not. We're not feel-good Christianity. Can I read some a little bit? We're not the social gospel. We're not a one-generational church. We're not a partial gospel church. We're not a political party. This isn't a black gospel or a white gospel. We're not woke. We're not trying to make secular humanists have, have sympathy for us. I'll tell you what we do. We preach the word of God from the front to the back. We tell people there's heaven and hell. We tell people that he still heals. He sets free. He delivers. He can make a cloud or eyes and a fire that guys he can do the supernatural thing and if he's never done it before how many think you'd like to see him do it right now in 2024 and I think that we must demand from ourselves and each other to say Lord help us to build a church that you don't want to break help us build a church that you want to build Lord, help us build a church on Palm Sunday that won't just be a burden to the culture or make people in a community scratch their head and say, that's a weird, that's a weird way of doing things, but that people will see that there is a living God who sits in heaven, but he also abides in the praises of God's people. The next generation hungers for this to happen. Okay, now back to the sermon. That felt good to say it. I don't know if you liked hearing it, but it needed to be said. Not only in Palm Sunday did Jesus want to break something, but on Palm Sunday, the people of God wanted to break something. They had become very angry themselves. Uh, in COVID, in Atlanta, the, government, the mayor had pretty much shut everything down. But the first thing to open was this place called the Rage Room. I don't know if you've heard of it. 
But the rage room is a place, and I think they got a picture of it coming, is a place that people could walk in, they'd pay a certain amount of money, and they'd either use hammers or axes or chainsaws or baseball bats, and they would just pay to walk in and break stuff. Now, there's a redneck side of me that really connects with that right there, but, but that's not because I'm angry. It's just because I'm like, here, hold my cup. <laughs> I'm going to break something. I, like, we've got a piano in the house. Well, we, there's a piano in Micah's house. We're trying to figure out what to do with it, and I'm like, man, don't tell the family, but I'd love to just set it on fire and watch it burn. Like, I would like to just take out my gun and just see how many holes I... It's just, just love this... It will not be recorded. Whatever we do in private will stay private. <laughs> but what happens is these people go in there and they, they exhibit this incredible rage because there's something inside of them that's broken. And when a people go through enough suffering, they get angry and they want to break something. 2006 Harvard study says that America is plagued with intermittent explosive disorder. Having a bad temper makes you three times more likely to have a heart attack. And I don't need a Harvard study to show me this. How many would agree with what I'm about to say? The more angry you become, the more stupid you become. <laughs> Case in point right there. I look around the church today just in here worshiping and praising God and knowing the people that I know around here, that there could be this low-level rage. It's, it's, maybe we would be better off to call it frustration. You walk in here today and, and there's just some things. Maybe somebody's lost a job or maybe you've just had the biggest fight in your marriage or you can't seem to communicate accurately with your children or... You can't seem to get your mind right. You've gotten victory before, but that old battle just keeps coming back. And maybe there's a, a lingering sin that just visits you seasonally and you, you give in to that and you just you don't want to say anything to anybody. But, but if you could walk into a rage room and you could just take out your anger and you just want to break something. I think we need to get real about it because I felt in my spirit as I was praying for you today, the Lord said, the thing that people in that service are, are frustrated with is not really the only thing they're frustrated with. It's just the thing that came after the thing that started frustrating them. And now the thing that you're dealing with, you actually are strong enough to handle that setback, but now it's just become, what is that phrase? The hair that breaks the camel's back. It's just that last straw. The calendar says it's spring. <laughs> I knew the Lord spoke to me when I, when, when I was shoveling this morning. I'm angry about that. Took the plow off, took the snowblower off. You all did too. How many plow trucks are stuck in somebody's backyard right now with a plow in the garage? This is the time the church numbers ought to start growing. I want to break this pulpit, but it's expensive. We got more snow this weekend than the past stinking four months. Some of you have a $12,000 snowmobile, and you didn't get to ride it one time. God is good. I just felt the embodiment of every Mainer in the state of Maine just flowing through me. <laughs> ah! Come on, somebody just give me a... Ah! Where's security? Where is the security? I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. God knows what it feels like to be angry. Jesus went to church and lost it. Where was the security team in the temple? <laughs> like if you go into the kids area without permission, they will body slam you. <laughs> I hope it's recorded. I'd like to see that. There's no apologies. Jesus did it. Nobody reported him. 
But he didn't lose control. He knew how to handle what was frustrating him. I want to suggest to you that the people that on Palm Sunday, and I'm getting to the end of my message. I'm not getting to the end of things to complain about, but I am getting to the end of the message. In 31 AD, this is when Palm Sunday happened. 31 AD is the time that the people climbed the palm trees and broke the branches and climbed back down the tree to give Jesus praise and an appropriate invitation into the city. What you may not know is history tells us that two years before that, a senator had attempted to elevate himself into the government. When Rome heard about it, they dethroned him, killed him, killed his family, and killed all his allies, and then uh, put a man named Pilate in on his job. And only to really make uh, an impact or teach the people a lesson, Rome increased, watch what I'm going to tell you, increased the taxes on the people in Israel, especially the people in Jerusalem, and made it hard for the people to survive. So every now and then, this is literal history, they would send a stimulus check just to keep them happy. Same playbook, different decade, different century. So the people of Israel for two years have been seething inside. April 15th is coming. How many know I am preaching the word of God today? <laughs> April 15th, you see it every week in your paycheck. It makes you angry. You see the things that are taking place in the world. And for two years... For two years, well, maybe now we can feel it. It was a moment that everybody felt the pinch. In the past few, few years, as a country, everybody felt the pinch of something. Even in World War I or II, not everybody felt the pinch, but in the past few years, everybody's felt the pinch. And in Israel, everybody felt the pinch. But then they heard Jesus was coming. Can I finish my message? I need something to work with. I'm not going to break this. No. I, I got actually it just dawned on me this morning. The people here, um, the people here. I feel like I can just be myself when it's this crowd. It's all those other land lovers, you know, they make me nervous. I don't need that. I don't need that. So, I, we don't have palm trees here, right? So I have to teach you. But when they heard that Jesus was coming to town, they said, we have been in pain so long that we just can't stand with our hands in our robes. <laughs> when Jesus comes to town, we got to break something. It's Matt Ward's translation. You have your own. What are we going to do? What can we break to just show that our praise isn't for our government and our praise isn't for our checkbook and our praise isn't for our political victory and our praise isn't based on what culture is doing and our praise isn't based on the inability for certain churches to do what God wants. And somebody said, let's take some palm branches and start waving them. Let's break off some branches. I thought that was pretty creative. You don't seem to, but I don't seem to mind. This is all I got to work with this morning. But I, the thought came to me. You know, if we were waving fir tree branches, you could just reach down and break one off. But palm trees, you don't just reach up and take off a branch. You got to climb the tree. You want to see Josh climb the tree? No, I'm just kidding, Josh. I won't do that. What I'm saying is, 
They were so angry, but they said, I think what we ought to do is turn my pain into praise. Come on, don't let me lose all of you that just identify with the fact that you've been frustrated with something. They said, we're going to break something. So those guys began to do something that when I did it as a kid, I always fell back down the tree. <clears throat> but they shimmied their way up the palm tree to break off a branch because they needed to do something to show that they were not going to let their feelings determine their obedience. They needed to do something to show <clears throat> they're not going to let praise be something that's convenient. I'm not, no, no problem with people that couldn't even get out of, I mean, it's like 20 inches of heavy sand out there for snow. I get it that some people couldn't get out. But I'm going to tell you, I'm in, I'm in church with a bunch of palm tree climbers who got up early, who made room, who made up their mind and made it a decision that their comfort was not going to make an excuse for not to give God the praise because if I'm going to go through some pain, I'm, I'm going to go through some frustration, if I'm going to go through some disappointment, if I'm going to deal with some setbacks, I'm going to do what I got to do, but I'm not going to let my pain be the end of the story. I'm going to climb up the tree and put aside some conveniences and break off a of praise and say, I might be hurting, but great is the King of Kings. I might be suffering, but he's still God. I may not know where he's doing, but I know that he's doing something. Come on. I'm going to break off a of praise or have a praise break and say God is good all the time and all the time God is good Woo, come on somebody turn your pain into praise somebody turn your suffering into a shout somebody turn your hurt into a hallelujah come on lift up those palm branch hands right now and begin to thank God that he's God he's good and he's king and he's Lord and he's going to take every broken thing every hurting area and he's coming to visit you today to bring healing Woo, somebody shout hallelujah come on give him praise for about two minutes somebody praise him hallelujah 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 to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, you do it for a minute. I'm tired. <laughs> Come on, praise him. Let me get a breath. I bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Ooh. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout a hallelujah. Got a word from the Lord for somebody on this snowy Palm Sunday to tell you that you've been frustrated and it's okay, but turn your pain to praise and watch the King of glory enter that situation and change it forever. Let's all stand together. The Lord told me you turn your pain to praise and generational curses will break. You turn your pain into praise and soul ties. People have left your life but they haven't left your mind. Time to let them go as you begin to praise the Lord. The Lord told me that if you'll begin to praise him, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, a defeated mindset is gonna be wrapped in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on, the whole band, all the singers, and any of you that want to be. No, I'm just kidding. Would you lift up holy hands to the Lord and say, Lord, you've been good. Even if you haven't got any pain, why don't you just begin to praise him? There's glory in this place. There's joy in this place. Come on, nothing, nothing complicated in church today. Just a simple hallelujah. Just a simple praise the Lord. Just a simple glory to his name. We'll bring the presence of God to your situation. You climbed over some snow. You climbed through some snow banks. You made some things happen that weren't easy. And for that, God's going to acknowledge your praise today. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wrote this down recently, not this week, but recently. I was in a time that I was really learning how to, how to praise God through some frustration. And the, the Lord put these words in me. Praise makes ugly things beautiful. Praise makes an underdog the wonder dog. Praise makes a loser into a winner. Praise will make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. That's not mine, that's Deuteronomy. The lender and not the borrower. And then from Paul I stole, praise guarantees that all things work together for good. I'm gonna tell you, we got a little time. You thought the first worship service was the only one. We're gonna end with another one today. And when you begin to praise him, healing and deliverance and strength and God's gonna go before you will happen based on his word. When you praise him, you get the manifest presence of God. It's coming to the screen near you. Second Chronicles 20, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise. And the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. Here it is. Thank you back there. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against the allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they destroyed the army of Mount Seir, they began to attack each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. I got good news for you today. They're be he's better than Joe Bornstein. If you praise the Lord, he'll make your enemies scatter he'll take care of his praisers not only when you praise does God manifest but when you praise favor comes Acts 2 46 they worshiped him together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people and each day the Lord added to the fellowship those who were being saved you know what a soul winning church is a praising church I said a soul winning church is a praising church because if he's alive, people want to see it demonstrated. Not only that, but when you praise him, he'll fight your battles. Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, relatives, family, go to the land and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make you famous and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who treat you, curse, contempt, give you contempt and all the families on the earth. In other words, when you praise him, what is fighting you, God fights. When you praise him, whatever's wearing you out, God will wear it out in Jesus' name. Vengeance, Psalm 149. Let's read the whole thing. Praise the Lord. Come on, sing, read it with me. Praise the Lord. Read the whole thing. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praises in the assembly of the faithful. O Israel, rejoice in your maker. O people of Jerusalem, exalt in your king. Praise his name with dancing, accompanied with a tambourine and a harp. For the Lord delights in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let the faithful rejoice that he honors them. Let them sing for joy as they lie on their beds. Let the praises of God be in their mouths, a sharp sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind the kings with shackles, leaders with iron chains, to execute judgment written against them. This is the glorious privilege of the faithful ones. Praise ye the Lord. Somebody praise him this morning and thank God for his glorious vengeance. One more. Oh, there's a hundred more, but one more for us. Power over a depressive spirit. Psalm 67, may the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us and people all over the world will fear him. When you begin to bless the Lord, people say it wasn't you that got that done, but it was God Almighty. I wish somebody would climb a palm tree, break off something and give him praise this morning like he's worthy to be glorified in this church. Come on, lift up those voices. Lift up your hands. Lift a shout unto the Lord. Dance if you want to dance. Walk if you want to walk. Weep if you want to weep. But do something to say to him, you're king and I'm not, and I give you praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, bless his name. Bless his name, bless his name. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, praise you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 